Thanks everyone. Since we wrote that blurb, we're actually down to three developers. So if anyone's looking for a job, do let me know. Um, so this, this talk is an attempt to focus on um, some of the things that we've picked up in our four or so years of Erlang experience, which we would have really liked to know when we started trying to write a large scale system with it. It's not intended as, a, as an Erlang tutorial or anything, so if you really have no idea or have never heard of Erlang, you might want to go and listen to the High Altitude Balloon talk because that sounded really cool. Um, can I just get a show of hands? Who, who has written some Erlang here? And, oh, well, cool, that's much better than we got at OSDC. All right, we'll just go with this then. So who am I and why do I think I've got any business talking to you about this stuff? As was mentioned in the introduction, I work at M5 Networks. We've got um, offices in Australia, but most of our sales and so forth are done in, um, are in, done in New York in the US. We provide enterprise-grade voice over IP. So the elevator pitch goes something like, if you're a company of, ten, uh, of 1,000 people or 2,000 people, you want a full enterprise voice over IP system, you go out to Cisco, you buy a call manager, you give them 50,000 bucks, slap it in, pay someone full-time to maintain it for you, and you're all good. If you're a company of 50 people, you're not going to be doing that. That would be in, insane financially. So what we have is a hosted call manager, like a Cisco one, except it's a proprietary one that we've written, sitting in a colo. We lease you a dedicated network back to that. You plug all your phones into it, share it with 50 other companies. You get all those same features, but you don't have to pay for the ridiculously expensive Cisco call manager or, and the guy to maintain it. And you don't have to worry about the SIP, the SIP backhaul and all those sort of things. We take care of everything. You want something changed, you just call, it up, call us up we fix it for you. So that's the environment we're, we're working in. We run about a bit, a bit over 8,000 phones on, a, on any given server, up to I think 10,500 is our biggest server, but that's probably bigger than it should be in all honesty. At peak we run about 150 calls um, per minute on, on each server. We provide real-time call control and reporting through web interfaces and um, so you can so that the receptionist can see everyone's phone, who's talking to whom, that kind of stuff, and reporting on uh, business intelligence type features. So you can have graphs of where your peak call times are, how many are answered, how many are going through to voicemail, and all these other, all these other pretty features that you expect from an enterprise grade system, conferencing, park pickup, blah, 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 blah. Pick your, pick your phone feature, we've probably got it in one form or another. And we also have some fairly, sorry, we also have some fairly um, tight requirements in terms, of, um, in terms of uptime because while everyone, particularly Windows users, are used to having to reboot their computer every few hours just because it crashed and that's what you do, no one's really used to having to reboot their phone and they don't like it when their phone suddenly stops being a phone and starts just being a grey plastic thing sitting on their desk. So that's the kind of environment we're working in. So what's Erlang? Well, for those of you who've already done Erlang, you know, but the, the key selling points are basically this. It's got a lovely, simple, powerful syntax. It's um, highly concurrent, highly robust, hot code loading. I'll go through all these in more detail later. This is just your bullet point list. We absolutely love it. We want you guys to love it too, but we've, on our journey, we've encountered a bunch of things that we would have liked to know earlier that aren't in the tutorials that you download off the web that you, you occasionally encounter in the, in the mailing list when someone else encounters the same problem, but they're not upfront for you to know. So that's kind of what I'm trying to cover here. So just very quickly, simple syntax. This is, this is what a quick sort looks like. Lists are a native type. Um, you've got nice little list comprehensions. It's a functional language, so there's no, there's no for loops, there's no while loops, that kind of stuff. Your for loops and while loops are done with tail recursion. Um, this is just very quick summary. Um, tens of, you can spawn tens of thousands of processes with, with, okay, they're called processes in Erlang. I'm going to call them threads from now on because that's what everyone's used to calling them. That's what they are in, in C. Tens of thousands of these threads with really no problem at all on my laptop. You don't need a massive server. They'll each cost you about 1.2 kilobytes of RAM, which compared to, you know, a, trying to spawn something, trying to spawn a thread in C, that's going to cost you probably a minimum of 256k on the stack, maybe up to 2 meg depending on how you've configured it and what your requirements are. Because the, because the processes, the threads, are, are a built-in type in Erlang, you've got also primitives for sending and receiving messages between them. And this is really, this is really the core of Erlang's selling point. It's this, it's this highly concurrent nature of it. So you can, whoops, there. The button is right next to one another. So here you can see you spawn a, a new PID in, this, in the local module and run it in the function f. And that, that PID is stored as a, the PIDs processes are also a primitive type in it. 
and we send it a message, so your exclamation mark there is send message, it's a tuple containing the atom message and some data, and then down here in F where the, functions, where the thread's actually running, you use your receive primitive, receive the message here and do something with it. And that's all, that's all built into the language and that's really nice and easy. It's highly robust. Within those 10,000 threads, crashes are localized. So what that means is we have a C++ system at the moment that has all those 8,000 phones connected to one Unix process. User does something unusual. We accidentally do a null pointer dereference. 8,000 phones stop working and 8,000 people suddenly call our support line. And we've only got 20 people working support lines, so that kind of causes a bit of a problem. You'd be surprised how many phones people have these days <laughs> and, how, and how irritated they get when even one of them stops working. Yeah, you would think that wouldn't be a problem, but no, apparently not. Um, so the, in Erlang, we spawn 8,000 threads, for one for each of those phones. If we do the Erlang equivalent of a null point of dereference, which, which causes a crash in that thread, that thread crashes, that phone reboots, one person calls our support line, and 7,999 people don't know that anything's happened. And everyone's a lot happier, except that one person, but you know, screw them. Um, as I say, compare that with, with what would happen in our existing C++ thing. It's also got hot code loading, which is a really cool idea, and I'll get to that later, why it's... Mm. So our Erlang journey, we, or rather my colleague Sam over there, discovered Erlang in, at LCA in 2007, and um, one of the projects we had to do immediately after that was to throw together a dynamic TFTP server because Cisco phones have their own interesting idea of what the TFTP standard looks like and it's not what you think the TFTP standard looks like. So he's throwing that together, came to me and said, dude, you've got to check out Erlang, it's really cool, it's exactly what we know. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've got a lot of null point of dereferences to fix over here, so just, I'll get back to me later. Next thing, he threw together a, um, a soft phone tester because, as you can imagine, you want to test 8,000 phones it's not practical to get 8,000 phones into the QA lab, hire 8,000 people to hammer on them all, see what happens. So while Erlang makes a great server, it also makes a great client to do that kind of stuff with. You, my, my laptop with this code can spawn 8,000 soft phones and just hammer the server with, with various requests and stuff, barely breaking a sweat. And when it does break a sweat, Erlang also has some great built-in distributed stuff, so you can have three or four computers all acting more or less as, as a single Erlang system talking to that without a lot of effort. It took me a day to go from a single machine system to an end machine system running the same bit of software. It was really, really nice. We're now, once we got some, a bit of acceptance with me and the other devs, we, we've started to use that as to, to build new core features into, into our system. Um, it's now used as a backbone of our call tracking and billing system, our real-time um, system to feed phone status to people's web pages and so forth. We're in the process, very slowly, of rewriting our entire core system, so that's why I was talking about before the, the C++ stuff versus the Erlang stuff. We're in the process of starting to move the core phone handling and call handling stuff to Erlang. Not there yet, but it's work in progress. And just as something fun, we're also building a new build system because we decided we didn't like make very much. And it didn't, it, it didn't quite, Erlang's got some interesting um, facets of its build stuff that didn't quite mesh nicely with Make. So what do, I wish, what do I wish we'd known when we started? Dialyzer, they don't tell you about this in most of the tutorials, but it's the most, single most useful tool that comes with Erlang. It's absolutely brilliant. Again, I'll go through each of these in detail. The VM can crash, you think you've got a nice crash-proof VM and only your processes will crash, but obviously it's still a Unix process, stuff can still go wrong. I'll show you what and how to avoid it. Message queues between processes, that stuff I showed you earlier, they pretty much just work and they're really great, except occasionally when they don't and then everything goes to hell. The OTP, which is a framework that comes with Erlang, is really, really crucial for building robust, scalable servers. I'll talk about that a bit later. Integration is a Unix-style service, being able to run this like Apache, service my Erlang process start. It's not actually very easy at all with the Erlang system. Hot code loading, yeah, that's interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And system monitoring, really crucial, really, obviously it's crucial. Everyone knows it, and a lot of people still forget it. So Dialyzer, Erlang is a dynamically typed language, which means, um, means you, you can, your, your function calls don't have strict types on them, your variables don't have strict types on them. You can just change the variable you're feeding, the 
type rather that you're feeding into a single variable and that will just change all the way down the chain through the function calls and so forth and that's all cool it makes refactoring really easy it also makes it really easy to miss bugs because the compiler doesn't check types at compile time and if you're calling into a separate module each module is compiled entirely independently the linking process does no cross-checking except that the function signatures in terms of name and arity are the same and so it has no notion that you just completely screwed up your system by changing one type Dialyzer is an attempt to do that in, by way of static code analysis. So you run Dialyzer over your system and much like Lint, it will look at all the code as a whole rather than as, as individual modules and attempt to trace all the possible types that could go through each call flow and build up a massive tree of that and then check that against how those types are being used later to make sure they match up. And I can't tell you how many bugs you will find in your Erlang code when you first use this. Um, it, because that is by far the most common mistake that, that um, newbies make with Erlang and us, for that matter. Every, pro, every Erlang program makes mistakes with types because the compiler doesn't catch it and no one really knows how to, how to catch it. Use Dialyzer. It will catch not all of them, but so many that y your code will improve in quality by an order of magnitude. How to crash the VM? Well, there's basically two main ways three if you count bugs in the VM, but we'll pretend they don't exist. Out of, out of memory conditions, especially on a 32-bit machine, it's easy on a large server to blow your three gig address space limit, and that'll just cause it to crash. There's no s fancy handling in Erlang, and if you believe the people on the, on the mailing list, nor should there be. And there's a couple of ways to, to easily do that as well. And LinkedIn drivers and NIFs, I'm not gonna talk about them, that's basically just ways of interfacing with native C code and if you're doing that you should already have read the documentation and that's very clear don't screw this up or your VM will crash. So non-tail recursive loops. As I said functional language so your standard method of looping over something is to use tail recursion. You've got your main loop, you do something, you wait for some input and then you call main loop again and the compiler knows that because, because this is the last thing that happens, it can throw away the stack that's built up for this, throw away, the, throw away the return address, and just go straight back to there, just like a loop. And that's all cool, that works perfectly, no problems. That doesn't. If you put a return, a return value there at the end of your function after what's meant to be the tail recursive call, it's got to maintain that stack so that it can return each of those back up the stack. And the compiler doesn't check for this, there's no, there's no way to hint to the compiler that, hey, this function's meant to be tail recursive, so everything I do, make sure it is. And so this will eventually cause you to run out of memory and crash if you leave it running as your main loop because the stack will just build up and up and up. And it won't be obvious what's going on until maybe a day later because it's chewing up very little, little amounts of RAM at a time. This is also bad. This looks like a really sensible, easy way of counting the number of iterations that have happened in a loop. In the end, end loop case, we return done. In the continue case, we add one to the count of the return value of this, so the very last iteration will return one and each one will have one added to it. Unfortunately, to do this, it's got to maintain the stack and as it returns back up, add one each time. And that breaks your tail recursion as well. That means you have your stack maintained and if that loop is run a million billion times or whatever, yes, you'll eventually be told that it ran a million billion times, but you've probably run out of memory before that happens. This is also bad. Erlang has a very nice exception handling system, it's try-catch system, and this looks like it should be fine. We call try, th try this block, case of this function, if, it, if we were told to continue, tail recurse call. Except it's not a tail recurse call because the catch down here also has to catch any exceptions thrown up from here. So that catch has to be kept on the stack. So that's not tail recursive. Thankfully, the Erlang guys came up with a way around this the try of syntax calls the function and then as soon as it returns happily it throws away the need for the catch this area here isn't protected by try catch but that means you can safely make tail recursive calls from there and the syntax it's very similar so it's very easy to to not do the right one when you're trying to write a loop like that so the second way to run yourself out of memory is queue overflow i showed you earlier the very simple way you pass messages from one process to another and that's all cool and nice and it pretty much just works except that um, on a very big system you can get caught out pretty easily 
And if you look at the mailing list, almost anyone writing a big system gets caught out like this. They have a logger process down here, and they have this log message function here. They've got a thousand processes all sending log messages here. And it says, send to the logger process a message tagged with log of this message. This guy's receiving all the log messages, does format and write, and writes it out. That's fine, does a tail recursive call. Except when you've got 10,000 or 100,000 guys all doing this, this process isn't going to be able to keep up. And the scheduler is fairly smart about working around this, but there are limits. And eventually, the message queue of the logger process will build up and up and up, and there's no internally enforced limit on those message queues, so you'll get in trouble there. This is kind of a more insidious version. Um, the, receive, the receive keyword allows you to do very cool stuff like only pull off messages off the queue that match a particular pattern. I'll call it selective receive. I don't know if there's a formal name for it. Unfortunately, this block here, while it looks like a normal receive, it's order n, where n is the size of the queue. Because when you arrive at this receive point, it's got to look linearly through the entire queue, the, the, the entire message queue that's currently there, to see if any match that message already. On the other hand, if you're matching, so capitals, just as a syntactic thing, variables that start with capitals are variables that can match anything unless they've been earlier bound. Things that start with a lowercase letter are atoms. They're um, like enums or whatever, so they don't, they don't have another value beyond particular message. So this, by contrast, is, is order one. You, um, you do the receive, you say I'll receive anything, do some other work, tail recurse, and that's fine. Selective receives look like they should be relatively easy to avoid, except they're, really, they're a really attractive thing to use, and they allow you to do a lot of cool stuff. So you've got to be careful where you're using them. The, problem, the biggest problem with selective receives is it may not be obvious in your code where you're using them. Just because you've got all the selective receives out of your code, if you're using Amnesia, for example, which is Erlang's very, very cool in-memory and disk database, and you have any calls to Amnesia transaction, hey, you've got a selective receive in there. And unless you've been caught out by this and had taken a look at the Amnesia code, it's not obvious from the docs. Another problem is, well, problem, benefit, whatever, however you want to look at it, is they can take ages to actually cause your, problem, cause your system to crash because this message queue can build up very slowly. R14 of Erlang, which came out last year sometime, has introduced the notion of um, new reference optimization, which partly solves this for some cases. It, for interest, doesn't solve it for the amnesia transaction case, but it does solve it for gen server call for anyone who uses that. New reference optimization means we make a reference here. That's a, that's a built-in which returns a guaranteed unique reference within the entire system. We send a message to the server process saying, tagged with that reference and your request. And we do a selective receive based on that reference um, here. This receive, it's selective, it's still order n, but it's only order n with respect to the size of the queue after this point, because the very smart people at Ericsson have said, nothing, oops, damn it, nothing that was in the queue prior to this point can possibly match this, because this reference only existed as of this point. So this receive only looks at your message queue from this point on. And that means even if you've got a you know, 500,000 element message queue, it doesn't have to look through all of that in that receive. And that, saves, that can save a lot of hassle. Moving on, the Open Telephony Platform, the OTP, it's a framework that comes with, um, that comes with Erlang. And it was designed by Ericsson um, to provide you with a framework to create robust and lo robust long-running applications. Don't be fooled by the name. It really has nothing directly to do with telephony. It's just that that's what Ericsson wrote the language for. So they, of course, named it like that just to put off everyone else from using it. But it's really totally invaluable for any long-running robust system you want to build with Erlang. It forces you to consider, um, it forces you to build a process tree of, of supervisors and processors and say, OK, if that process crashes, what happens? What do I need to do about it? So in the case of one of those 8,000 phone processes, fine, you probably don't need to do anything about it. You just let it crash. The phone will reboot, reconnect, and spawn another process to handle it. 
If though it's a long running um, server thread that needs to keep existing, you might tell the supervisor of it, hey, yeah, I need, to, I need that to constantly be running. So if you see it stop for any reason, always restart it. You can do even more complex stuff like if, if you've got, say, four or five interdependent threads where if you lose the state of one, the other three kind of become broken, you can say, hey, if any of these four crash, reboot the whole four of them and, and get, that, get that whole subsystem started again. And because you've got to specify each of these for each of your supervisors and each of your processes, it forces you to draw up this diagram, at least in your head, and, and consider it in your system, which is something that most other systems don't force you to do. You don't want to use this if you're writing a Hello World project or just a little text parser or something. But if, you, if you're intent on writing a proper server with Erlang, something that's going to be running for a long time, you're insane if you don't use this. The other thing the OTP does is um, solve problems with Erlang that you didn't know you had, but that you would have found out sooner or later about. So the example I've got here, if you want to send a message from one process to another and receive a response, so you've got a server process over here that's serving up resources. And it says, and you, and you say, please give me a resource that responds, here's your resource, no problem. Well, it looks like this code would be sufficient. Send a message to the server proc, request, request data, you receive a response, response data. Except that, what if, what if it sent you the wrong response? What if, what if something earlier in, in your process made the same request and didn't wait for a response correctly or something? Well, we can use the make ref that we looked at earlier. Tag the response, tag the request with it rather. Man, this formatting's rubbish, sorry. Um, receive the, uh, and receive a response with that reference in it. So now we know it's the right response. So what if the server process doesn't exist? You know, for whatever reason, it's, it's crashed, it's in the process of restarting, but hasn't come up yet. Okay, so we can use this built-in function, where is? And if we get undefined back, we know there's no process, so we return an error. If, you know, like if you send a, a message to a named process that doesn't exist, just without checking, it will, your process will crash, and that's really not what you want to happen. If we do get a PID back, then we do that stuff that we did before, make the reference, send the request, get the response. Okay, that's cool, that seems to solve that problem. So what if it died after we did the where is before we sent the message? Okay, so we'll add a timeout here. If we don't get a response back in five seconds, error with a timeout, but don't crash. Yeah, don't really want to have to wait five seconds for that though. Okay, so we can do Erlang monitor the server process. And this is all starting to get a bit complex. Uh, monitor returns this down message if, if the process crashes at any point. And we've got to remember to demonitor it once we get the response back or if there's an error. And it's all looking a little bit complex for what was supposed to be a fairly simple function call. And what if it doesn't support monitoring? C nodes and Java nodes don't actually support node monitoring. And well, after all that, you go, hey, the OTP has handled all this for you. All you've got to do is write your server as a gen server, which means you adhere to a particular, to a particular interface. And that means any client can just call gen server call, whatever the call is, and it will return either a timeout or a node proc or the actual response or whatever, whatever is, is the appropriate response there. So that's one thing the OTP gives you. Also gives you a bunch of other stuff, supervision trees, which I mentioned earlier, event handlers, subscribe notify type things, so you can say, I want to, be, I want to receive a message whenever this particular event happens. Um, and that, this, this gives you a framework for building those very simply. FSMs, and so on and so forth. That's the OTP. <laughs> Running Erlang as a Unix service. Erlang was, has, a, has an embedded heritage, which means it was basically built to run on, to run on Ericsson switches. And as most of you probably know, if you've got an embedded service, all you want to happen is you flick the box on, it starts running, and it keeps running until you flick the box off. And that's cool if you're building an embedded device. In the Unix world, that's not what our sysadmins want at all. They want to be able to run service Apache start, service Apache stop, service Apache status, find out what's going on, and they want feedback as to whether that startup has worked and whether that stop has worked and whether it's had to do a kill or whatever to actually get it to shut down. Erlang really doesn't play nicely with that in its, in its current form. Because the standard way of starting up an Erlang application is to call Erl with, say, no shell, which says, I don't want to be dumped into a shell, I want to be dropped back at my terminal. Detached, don't, give me, don't, don't continue spewing 
console messages to my terminal and run my app boot script. Which is cool, because you run that and it always returns zero. Success, start it up. Does that even if it failed initialization, which is a bit of a problem. Also, detached gives you no console output ever at all, which is kind of bad if your sysadmin is expecting to see a message saying, hey, I can't find your database, so I've shut down. No, just return success, everything's good. Ah, oh, but it's not running, whoops. Sysadmins don't like that. There's also no easy way in Erlang to write out a PID file. Yes, you could get your code to, to write it as its sort of first order of business, but as your app gets more and more complex, you'll find there's a lot of built-in code to the system that runs before you get to execute any code at all. And if any of that fails, or God forbid hangs, you've got no PID file to see where the process is to kill it. And that's, of course, when you need your PID file most of all, is when you're trying to kill a rogue process, especially on a busy system. You don't want to have to be gripping through PS to find which of the hundred different Erlang things that various people are running is the one you need to kill. Heart is Erlang's way of managing crashes of the VM. It's effectively a soft software watchdog, and it's a, it's a great idea for embedded systems. It, it and Erlang ping each other back and forth at, at some predefined interval. And if it misses a certain number of pings, it considers the process to have either died or hung or whatever. It kills it and restarts it. Similarly, Erlang is watching heart, so if the heart process dies, it will restart that. And that's cool, but if you actually need to kill a broken system and you go kill the Erlang process, heart will go, oh, I see the Erlang process died, I'll restart that. Or you go, oh, whoops, okay, that didn't work, I'll kill the heart process first. And Erlang goes, oh, the heart process died, I'll restart that. And you can see how this is gonna get you into trouble. Kill stop will help, but ultimately it would be better if we didn't have to if we didn't have to deal with that problem at all. Erlang's idea of log rotation again stems from its embedded heritage, and it's not what you're used to on Apache. There's no way to handle SIGHUP the, the normal way, as you're probably aware, to rotate logs is to go kill SIGHUP Apache, it and, and it interprets that as a log rotation message. Erlang native Erlang code has no way of catching signals, so you can't do that. And all of that stuff together, plus a few other little things, make it a real pain in the backside to actually write deb and RPM packages for Erlang stuff that do all the stuff that sysadmins are used to. Yes, you can write a, a, an RPM package to install the stuff, but to do, to do your standard upgrade where they just go RPM upgrade this and expect it to stop it and start it, they have their log rotation scripts which they expect to just work, yeah, it all becomes a little bit difficult. So we ended up writing our own solution for this called Erld, which set, runs on the same principle as GNU screen. It grabs the terminal, forwards all the stuff to your terminal until it receives a message that you can pass to it through Erlang code saying, I've completed my startup, I'm now running happily. You can detach from the, from the console and tell, tell the user to, to, that, that all has gone well. Or it can return error messages, or error values rather. It also continues to log that console output once it's detached, which is another nice thing. It intercepts, because it's a standard C process, it can intercept SIG hups and, and send an Erlang message to Erlang to do the log rotation, and then you can write your own log rotation handler in there. Like Heart, it manages crashes and restarts, but you can also send in a message to say, hey, really kill Erlang properly this time. And while I'd love to give you a URL to get it, it's kind of not open source yet. I really want it to be by like the middle of this year. Business, what are you gonna do? Hot code loading. Hot code loading is a really, really cool idea. It means that you have a running system with 8,000 phones up. If you want to apply a patch to that process, and say so you've got to take all 8,000 phones down, put in a new binary, start it back up, have them all reconnect. Everyone's phones go down, so you've got to do it in the middle of the night, and that makes for sleepless sysadmins who give me grief over email the next morning. Hot code loading notionally allows you to actually replace running code without it even stopping. So you can apply a patch to the code that's running that phone without even dropping the TCP connection that that phone's running on. And that's a really, really cool idea. So the question is, why don't big Erlang program, um, big Erlang applications like eJabberD and yours use this all the time? Because it sounds awesome. And the answer is, it's really, really, really hard. Turns out not to be this nice utopia that they promised it would be. Um, there's no good tools to help you do it. 
The documentation is pretty patchy. It's getting better, but it's not, it's not something that you're just going to be able to jump in and go, oh yeah, now I want to add hot code load into my project and a day later have it all working. There's no good easy way to implement it, to, to integrate it with package management systems. What sysadmins want in their ideal world and what we'd love to give them is to be able to go RPM, upgrade your Erlang service and have it hot code load into a running system and have the new version of the RPM on there. And that's more or less, well, nothing's impossible on computers, but for all practical purposes, it's pretty much impossible at the moment because of the internal way Thank you. that, that, these, that um, versioning and so forth is done with the hot code loading stuff. And it's really hard to test. If you've got 8,000 phones, they're probably in 8,000 different states. And people are quite sensibly reluctant to just hot patch code that, uh, across 8,000 different states and hope it will work for all of them. So finally, system monitoring. Erlang's VM has a lot of cool ways to monitor different parts of your system, but obviously that's only useful if you actually bother to turn them on. It's very tempting with a, with a system like Erlang, which is supposedly so robust and unstoppable, to not even bother to monitor it, because hey, what could go wrong? A lot of stuff could go wrong. <laughs> Trust me. This is by no means a complete list. It's just a, a starting point of a few things that you can look at. Erlang, it's not easy to leak memory, it's very easy to leak processes because they're so easy to spawn and if you're not paying attention to where you're spawning them and how you're cleaning them up once you're done with them, you'll get process leaks which eventually are basically a memory leak and a resource leak and you'll run out of memory. So you can check, just call length Erlang processes and that just gives you a single value for how many processes you've got going on in your system. And you can graph that over time and if it's going up, hey, you've probably got a problem in there, you might want to look at it closer. Queue length, if you've got 100,000 processes in your system, you're not going to monitor every process's queue. That's insane. But if you've, if you've got a few busy server processes, such as that debug process I was talking about earlier, well, you probably want to take, keep an eye on its queue length. Then you can do that with that function there, just pass in the pit of the process you're interested in. And again, if you see that start to grow over time, you can get to it before it causes a serious problem. When we had, when we had this problem caused by selective receives, looking back, post-mortem on the graphs, it was obvious that we could have tracked down this, we, we could have seen this problem happening 48 hours before it actually crashed the VM had we been looking in the right place, which we weren't. And finally, total memory use. It's, um, it's on, a, on a big server, obviously, it's a bigger problem on a 32-bit machine than a 64 one, but if you start eating into your swap, your performance is going to probably suffer pretty badly anyway. So you can monitor your total memory use, and you can see breakdowns of that by more and more detail. So what are the things I want you to take home from this if you're going to be writing any kind of Erlang system? Understand tower recursion, understand how, how you can get it wrong and how not to get it wrong. Keep your message queues short. That's not a hard and fast rule. There, there, are, there are plenty of cases where you might want to be able to have a huge spike in, in calls because something has happened, in messages rather, because something's happened, and then churn through those you know, lazily later on. But as a general rule, unless you know what you're doing, unless you know why you're doing it, keep your message queues short. Be careful of selective receives. They're very powerful, but they can get you into trouble if you're using them on a really busy process. You'll need to do some work to get your, your application to work cleanly as an Erlang service. At least you will until I can get our company to open source LD. Hot code loading. Just because it's on the brochure and that's what everyone says Erlang supports doesn't mean you'll be able to easily put it into your project. It's a really cool idea and I'm sure it'll get there eventually and I'm sure we'll be able to use it in the not too distant future, but it's a lot of work. It's not just a drop-in feature. Monitor your system, use OTP, use Dialyzer. That's it, I'm done. Questions? <laughs> Lens. Hi, uh, you talked in, I think, first or second slide um, about build systems and that makes not really cutting it. Uh, have you had a look at Rebar? We have had a look at Rebar. Rebar is very, very cool for what it's very, very cool for. Unfortunately, what it's cool for is not quite the, the complexity of the system we're, we're building. Um, Sam will probably, in the blue t-shirt right in front of you, will talk your ear off at great length about why Rebar didn't quite cut it for us. I, I wasn't directly involved in that, but he, he can explain that at length. But yes, re Rebar is very cool for, for building certain projects and no, no question at all. Unfortunately, it, it lacked some stuff that we wanted to be able to use and, and it wasn't necessarily easy to retrofit it. 
I've uh, got uh, two questions, but they're both uh, pretty short. Uh, firstly, the test suite that you talked about uh, early on, we had, uh, say, 8,000 uh, soft phones on a single machine, you're hammering a server with that. Yeah. Is that publicly available? And if so, where can I get it? Uh, secondly, um, the um, uh, process model in Erlang, how does that actually map natively to native threads uh, provided by the operating system? Is it one thread per process, or is there some kind of thread pooling? How does that work? Cool. So in answer to your first question, you can't get it at the moment, unfortunately. Um, our, our company has yet to quite see the light on open source. We're pushing it, but unfortunately not. And to be perfectly honest, because that was the first major bit of Erlang code we wrote, I'd rather no one ever saw it. <laughs> Your second question, um, in terms of mapping threads to Unix processes, the answer is the reason they're so lightweight is because they don't map one-to-one -one with, with Unix processes. What Erlang does instead is it launches one Unix-level thread for each core on your machine, and then it has an internal scheduler that schedules the threads within those. So, so you get all your SMP benefits, but without the heavyweight process-level threads. Um, you talked about selective messaging uh, being of order n, where n is the length of your queue. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to have a, a receive that receives a selected message and do something else with anything else in the queue? Yeah, ab absolutely. The, the, so so were, it is possible to keep the queue length short Those anyway. were very, very simple uh, receive blocks. You could, but they, you think of them as a, as a case block for what's in the queue. So you can have a whole bunch of different things there. and. If, if there's a catch-all at, at the end which says catch anything, then it will still only have to look at the first item in your queue because it says, ah, that'll match anything. So even if I don't have any of those, I'll pull in the first one anyway. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, the finite state machine in OTP always seems to be the one that no one uses. It's, you know, gen, redded, stepchild sort of thing. Yes. And <laughs> are, are you using it at all? What for? Just out of curiosity. More I am for one thing and now I can't think what it is. Oh, so I'm, I'm using it for a very simple um, SIP state machine. SIP, SIP um, uh, conversation state, conversation is not the word I'm looking for, but you know, a, a, a SIP transaction state machine. But it's only, I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily advocating use of it for a full SIP thing because this is a very, very limited subset of SIP which is used for, um, for CNAM, which is the American Calling Number Identification System, which maps incoming numbers to pretty names. Um, so, so it's a, basically it's send a request, receive an acknowledgement, receive a response, send an OK back, and that sort of and, and a few error cases on the side. So, GenFSM was was really nice for that, but I can see how on a much bigger, more complex state machine, it might actually be easier to just write your own and not use GenFSM. Hi. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask a question about inline assembler, but um, I'll put that <laughs> off until later. But um, I was interested <laughs> in the supervisor processes. We were increasing reliability by having the processes watching other ones and yeah. restarting them if they die. Do they run as a separate Unix process? Not as a separate Unix process, uh, well, so with the exception of Hart, um, which is like the, 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 the watchdog for the whole VM. The supervisors that the OTP provide are, are each separate Erlang processes. Okay, so um, still vulnerable to the VM stiffing it. And sorry, still still vulnerable to the VM yes, dying and yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah, the the only thing that'll that'll save you from a VM crash is heart or LD or something similar watching the whole process. No one. Any else? other questions? Come on, We've I've got, like got a two minutes. minutes to fill. Actually, no, you've got twelve minutes to fill. Twelve minutes to fill. Oh, did I finish that early? <laughs> yes. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I don't mind. I don't. Mind. Anyone, anybody else? Oh. Talk, talk. So I, I'd imagine then with the OTP and the supervisor processes, it's not possible to have them running in a separate Erlang VM to the, the other one. There's no cross VM communication. Theoretically, it is, but you wouldn't. You really wouldn't want to do it. I, I, I can't. I can't really see any benefit to doing it that way versus versus anything else because the. Erlang has very good cross machine and cross. They're, 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 each Erlang process. Unix process is, co is called a node. So you can run multiple of them on, on your machine if you want, or you can run them across multiple machines. That's more or less transparent to, to, to the code itself. Um, and it's got very good inter-node communication stuff, and, and processes can monitor processes running on other nodes and so forth. But if you go down that road, you've just introduced another point where things can go wrong. So the, the supervisor might think this process has died because someone pulled out the network cable. In fact, everything's still running fine. It'll try to spawn another one. It'll go, oh, I can't reach that machine at all. I'll spawn it here. And then suddenly you've got two processes running. It's, um, yeah, you can certainly, I mean, there, there are certainly some, some robustness things you can do with multiple machines. 
running the supervisors on different machines to the stuff they're supervising is probably not one you'd want to do. Yeah, well, one machine, two VMs, or uh, I, again, I'm not really. I guess I guess you could do it. I don't really see any fundamental reason why not, but probably more to the point, I don't see any fundamental reason why. The only example I've seen is sometimes you can use it to give yourself some isolation uh, with NIPs. Sure. If you yeah, that's that's not a bad that's not a bad reason. Although, um, if you're if you're that worried about your NIFs, you probably haven't done enough testing on them. Um, you probably shouldn't just be, shouldn't be running them in a production environment at all. Um, and if you if you have a system that's uh, external calls that are sufficiently complex that you can't not be worried about them, you should probably be using a, a, a port program instead of a NIF. Which is for for those who don't know, a, a NIF is a natively implemented function. So you write the function in C code and a little bit of shim code, and you can call that directly as an Erlang function. A port program by contrast, runs as a completely separate Unix process and the Erlang VM talks to it via stand-in, stand-out. So it can, be, it can be monitored and restarted if it crashes and so forth in isolation from your VM, whereas the NIFs, if you get that wrong, your VM's going to crash. Um, I just have a more general question. How would you rate Erlang as a learning language for people who are new to functional programming compared to Haskell, for example, or anything else? I have opinions on Haskell. <laughs> um, now, I think Erlang's... Erlang is not a pure functional language, so it's not going to introduce you to all of the all of the interesting academic stuff that the Haskell includes, um, monad, monads and so forth. There's there's, there's nothing like that. Um, as an introduction to, to some of the more more basic stuff, such as tail recursion, such as um, invariant variables and so forth, it's probably pretty good. Um, it's it's built. And I mean no disrespect to Haskell when I say this, but it's built as a very practical language. It was written from the ground up so that Ericsson could write these telecommunication systems with it. Um, so, so there's a lot of, because it's not, it's not pure functional and a bunch of other sort of trade-offs have been made against that. Um, as a learning language, it's probably not a bad starting point, but it certainly won't, won't cover all the bases that, are, that, are, that a pure functional language will. Any other questions? Or do we want to get an early start on afternoon tea? Mm -hmm. Afternoon tea. <laughs> well, on behalf of the organisers of uh, 2000 and LCA 2012, there's a thank you gift thank for you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your presentation. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vernon. Before we all disappear.